We're here with Guru Sanjay Dutt while he's meditating. We're going to try to see if we can interrupt him for a second and ask him a few questions. <coughs> Sanjay! Guru! Uh, hello, Mr. West. Hi, Sanjay. I want to say I love you here and I love you being here today. I, I love you too, Sanjay. Let's see what I got here. I go sitting on my wallet. I got, how about that? I got a couple bucks. As little as 50 cents can save a child. Yeah, uh, the children are going to love this. The cause is going to love this, Mr. West. Please, would you mind joining me in a meditation? It'd be my honor. Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Breathe in the air and feel that. <laughs> what you gonna do? You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. Be awesome. That's hard time. To be the man. Call in with a question or comment. Six. One. Can you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold oh, the damn phone. Call three. At 1-877-800-8834. That's how I roll! You're sex dependent! Come get some! Because I've done all of that! And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Gargiulo. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. My name is Eric Orjulo and let's get right to it. I am really excited to have tonight's guest on the show. He is a former TNA wrestling superstar, an international wrestling sensation, and now a gangsta rapper. He is my old friend <laughs> Sanjay Dutt. Sanjay, welcome to the show. How's everything going, man? Ah, that's good. I was hoping you were going to rap your way into the show. No, no, no. You know what? That, that's completely being blown out of proportions. I'm a rapper now. But. <laughs> wow. So what's the story behind that? Uh, the story behind that is, I mean, uh, a buddy of mine, I actually met this this guy at one of the fan fests we were doing. Uh, he was an Indian guy, and he came up and he said, hey, man, I'm a rapper. And I said, well, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm a big hip-hop fan, big rap fan. So I said, you know, let me check out your CD. He gave it to me. I, I liked it. We, we started talking. We kind of hit it off and became good friends. And, uh, you know, through the process, he actually wrote uh, a rap, rap, uh, an entrance theme for me. And I I presented it to TNA, to Dixie and her husband, and they loved it. They were actually, they put, they approved it. They they put the green light on it. It was going to be my new entrance theme uh, at TNA. But that was, you know, right before my contract came out, so that didn't happen. But, uh, and then he he pitched an idea and he said, hey, man, you know, you should try to, try to rap on my, on my next uh, CD. I said, well, hey, you know, if you teach me, I can, you know, I'll give it a shot because I have, I have no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> That's all that is. That's yeah. all that is. So were you surprised when you saw some of the other, like, wrestling websites and everything pick it up as, as Sanjay Dutt was, making rap yeah. debut? Yeah. I was shocked because, first of all, I was like, how did, how did the wrestling sites even pick this up? Because it was just something me and him had talked about. And I guess, I, I guess if on his website he had a picture of me and he said, it said something like, hey, coming soon to the next city or big question mark, something, something along those lines. I guess somebody saw it somehow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was all over the news site. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, you know, in, in this day and age of wrestling. I mean, as compared to, you know, when you and I were fans, this whole 24-hour oh God. news cycle of uh, wrestling. It's crazy. It's crazy because it's just it's an independent rapper and based in Detroit, and somebody saw that, and it, the next thing I'm the next I'm a next John Cena. I'm a big next rap star. So <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a crazy world, man. Wow. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you heard, but I was playing a little bit uh, of a clip. I heard. I did. Okay. What you What do you think about that? And listening back to it. I, I laughed. I, th- I thought it was. I thought at the time I thought it was funny, and, and to me it's still funny. It's it's. You can't take any of that seriously, and I mean, you just gotta have fun with it. It was funny. Don West, I think, uh, is is absolutely hysterical, and it, it the audio just didn't do it justice. You gotta see the nonsense that he was wearing in that piece. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, and I, 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 it brought back some memories, man. It was actually right when the groove stuff started, man. It was it was a lot of fun. I thought it was funny, and, and like 
you know, a lot of criticism with, with the character and stuff, but it, you can't take any of that seriously, man. The, the character wasn't a serious character. It, it was goofy. It was, it was funny. You know, just roll with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you know knowing you as, as long as I have, you know, I always tried to follow you a little bit in TNA just to see how things are going. But, you know, honestly, I, I couldn't get through five minutes of the show, uh, you know, on a week-to-week basis. So I, I missed a lot of the good stuff. And, you know, I was doing a little research before I had you on and figured I'd grab, you know, a, a clip somewhere sure. or, or whatever. And I came across that on YouTube, and I was hysterical. I'm thinking, man, <laughs> this is money. Yeah, you know, but we, we did a lot of a lot of. Uh, you know, goofy stuff like that at the, at the beginning, you're just trying to get the character over. And once it got over, like, it was only for a few weeks where they actually invested some time into the character themselves. Yeah. And from then on out, it was, you know, they, they had gave me no direction and there was you no know, time really being invested. So I kind of took it upon myself to just do what I felt was right for the character. And I had a blast doing it because whatever I thought worked, could work with the character, I did it and, and bro, it, it got over, yeah. you know? It, it, it didn't get over in the sense, hey man, I'm going to be drawn money headline in shows but it got over and it was a good mid-card act and you know me and jay had a had a you know a year-long feud based off of that stuff it was great man i had a blast with it yeah well now, now when, when you have something like that that i mean i'm watching it as an objective observer and i think it's great i mean you're telling me you got a good reaction you know what what's the process of, of it just not being played out uh you know what it, there's a, probably a lot of answers for it but i mean about a bottom line comes down to is like with their writing, it was like if you're not on top, they really didn't pay much attention to what was going on or mm. pay attention to detail. And matter of fact, they really don't pay attention to detail with what's on top either. So, I mean, <laughs> I think it just kind of gets lost lost in the shuffle. It's like, hey, you know, we got to give these X-Division guys characters and stuff, and that was their main goal at the time. I think it was like around 2007. So, you know, they gave uh, Lethal the, the Macho Man deal. You know, let's make Sanjay the guru, and then, to them, it was that was enough. Let's give them a character, and that that was enough. But what it isn't enough, you know. Yeah. You got to spend time with the character. You got to get it over the get it over to the fans. You got to got to have them understand it because for so long they didn't see me as a guru. They didn't, you know. Yeah. I have worked there six years, and then out of nowhere I'm a guru. So it's right. like that time wasn't invested, and I think that they just felt that just giving the character was enough, which it wasn't. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and again, just you know, as a as a viewer, and you know, it, it, it is what it is. But you know, I try to watch TNA and just kind of follow for my radio show and my website sure. and, and that kind of thing. And, and I guess my biggest criticism of it, because I think some of the wrestling is fantastic. Um, sure. I, I guess my biggest criticism of it is just there's no continuity. You know, I'll watch one no. week and then the next week, either the angle's completely dropped or they're doing something that makes no sense as you know compared to what I saw the week mm -hmm. before. Yeah, and, and I mean, a lot of it has, and also, I mean, what you said is 100% right, and, you know, I saw it while I was there, and another part was, it was one week you'd see a guy, or a couple weeks, or two or three, four weeks, you'd see a guy, and he'd have a good run on television, and out of nowhere, he'd be gone, and yeah. he wouldn't be on TV for three weeks, and so the fans that had just gotten into this character, or, you know, invest, invested four weeks, and, in, you know, enjoying this guy, and he's getting over, and he's starting to click, and then out of nowhere, he's not on TV, yeah. and I mean... You know, with TNA, there's a large roster, and they try to fit it on as many people as they can each week, but then a lot of guys, it, it has it's no other reason than it, they just get lost in the shuffle and they don't get booked on that TV. And a lot of times it happens to, happens at the at the wrong time, you yeah. know. It's right when somebody's starting to kick off. It's right when somebody needs to, needs to be on every week and their legs just get cut. Yeah, and, and, and I guess, you know, something I've been talking about on my radio show, I even had um, Jeff Jarrett on my show uh, years ago. Did uh, you really? Yeah. <laughs> after, after, after four no-shows, uh, he, he, called <laughs> him, he called him randomly out of the blue one day. I said, yeah, it's, really? great, to, I said, yeah, it's great to have you on, but we planned it, you know, six weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff gets to you what he wants. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. and, and what I talked to, you know, and what I expressed to him and something that I've just kind of been accustomed to hearing from my callers is I think there's a struggle with fans in that, you know, we watch guys like yourself and the Motor City Machine Guns and the, a lot of the X Division guys, and you get really into the match, and then you're kind of uh, suffocated, more or less, by, you know, the guys on top that have been there, you know, in the WWE sure. that, that you're tired of seeing. And my contention has always been, and yeah, you know, maybe they don't know Sanjay Dutt today, right. but, you know, right. if you had the patience as a company 
for, you know, three months, you know, even five, six months and developed all of that young talent over time. I think that they could make a, a huge dent in the wrestling world by presenting all of these new stars, a new athletic form of wrestling that is so different than what the WWE has. And yet, you know, I think what, what frustrates fans is, you know, it's kind of just a retread of whoever decided to get mm-hmm. released today is now a main eventer over here. You know, you're 100% right, and, like, what frustrates me a lot of times is, is the company line is they're always saying that, and I don't know I don't know if it's a company line or if it's the defense of the product and the writing, but they're always saying that this is, you know, it's different. They want to be different, but it's not different, Eric. And, I mean, what you said is completely right. It's, it's just a different version of what you see on Monday and Thursdays yeah. or when SmackDown on Fridays. It's just a different version of that, and it's not different. It's just it's the same thing. And like you said, if the, it, a lot of those guys, let's say Motor City Machine, that's myself, a lot of PDL, we were, I mean, we've been there for five, six years for ages, and if they had, they had began at, right when we, right when we got with the company at year number one, by year number six, you know, some of these guys could be headlining, yeah. but it never started at the beginning. And now it, I don't know. If, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's like if you started down, if you started at year one, now at year five or year six or year seven, you can get them to where you want to get them. But that they never started, so yeah. it's like you're still stuck with the same guys on top. Yeah, and you know, uh, recently I think over the weekend they had their, their pay per view, and AJ Styles won the title. And you know, right. I think it's great. You know, three years ago, if it happened, sure. it, it kind sure. of really defeats the you know the intensity of it. Doing it now at this point after he's been there for eight years, and if he would have done exactly. this, you know, three four years ago. Yeah, it, it, you know, it kind of reminds me of. Uh, I mean, I I don't know if you remember when when Monty Brown was there, and yes. it's like. When they should have pulled the trigger with Monty, they didn't. And then when they did finally pull the trigger, it was it was like too late. Yeah. You know, yeah. you should have done this a year ago, six months ago. It just it was too late. Timing is so essential. And I, and, and I mean, I don't know what the answer is or why it's not done at the right times. But it, you know, they're not hitting the right time with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Does it um does it I guess um I don't know make you curious anyway? It seems like the the reports that that are coming out of there now and from what people are saying is that Dixie is getting more involved and in calling the shots and even telling the talent you know they got they got to step it up in the ring and uh, does that kind of you know raise your eyebrows a little bit? Uh you know what it's interesting because I mean that stuff wasn't going on when I was there and I, I, I you know what. I, I think a lot of it probably has to do with a certain level of frustration after so many years. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I know that uh, you know the breaking even, maybe maybe you know pulling in some profit from from international syndication and stuff like that. But you know, bottom line is is money, Eric, and it's yeah. business. And you know, you lose so much money and you're not seeing any return from it. And I think uh, you know at this time she she's she's uh, figured out that she needs to buckle down. And uh, I mean, the slew of problems lately with those guys. I mean, it's just. It's just you know, after Angle getting arrested, Daniels getting arrested, his visa problem, people getting released left and right. I mean, it's it's got to be a mess, and it's got to, you know, I don't envy her job trying to, you know, sort all that out and now finally trying to make a change in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, what's your take on uh, the recent changeover? Because it seems like, uh, you know, there's been more changeover in the last, I don't know, six to eight weeks uh, management-wise and booking-wise than there has been in the last eight or nine years that, that the company's been around. It's, it's been crazy. It's been crazy. Every week it's something else and something new. And uh, it's interesting that everybody that's getting let go is, you know, like just, just allies and stuff like that. And I, I mean... Like I said, I'm not there anymore, and I don't know what the inner workings are. But it's just interesting that all the Jeff's allies are getting moved, getting you know slotted out. And I think the latest uh, thing with Jim Cornette getting released, I think you can finally see that Dixie is, is completely 100% behind Vince Russo and his his story writing. Yeah. Now, now when when you were there, uh, you know, and and I I've asked guys this um, when I've interviewed guys and girls, you know, that have worked with Vince Russo in the WWE and, and WCW. Mm-hmm. And one, one of my favorite questions is to to ask them is what is the craziest uh, storyline or angle Vince Russo ever proposed to you? And I you know I've heard some good answers, I've heard some bad answers. Anything crazy you ever threw at you? You know what? Nothing. Nothing too crazy. Um, I, nothing, nothing too crazy, man. I, I can't really call anything too goofy or crazy. No, uh, no hands giving birth or any of that <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> but I, I guess, the, I guess the goofiest thing that that I was a part of was uh, we did a we did a gimmick match. And I mean, I, I don't want to say this was Russo's idea because I don't know whose idea it was. Yeah. It was somebody's idea there, but we did a goofy little gimmick match where it was a it was a tuxedo match and 
it was a chain match at the same time. <laughs> so not only not only were we chained together, but we had to rip tuxedos off while we're chained together. And nobody kind of figured out that when they when you do that, you're going to have clothes hanging on the middle of this chain. So we had this big, you know, like. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the the dress shirt and pants all just stuck in the middle of the chain, and we're trying to work them out. It was it was a mess, man. But we tried our hardest. We tried our hardest to make it work, man. I, like I said, I don't know if it was Vince's idea whose it was, but yeah. it was it was a good thing. That, that's, that's, and uh, that's tremendous. in that year, that that year few that we did, me and Jay, we did we did some goofy stuff too. Yeah, yeah, that, that's tremendous. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> now, now, you know, uh, for, for the fans out there um, that really just follow WWE and TNA, um, you know, maybe you can update them a little bit as what you've been up to since they've last seen you on Spike TV. Well, uh, you know what? I've been spending most of my time now with Ring of Honor, and uh, they're on HDNet on Monday nights at 8, right before Raw. So uh, definitely, if anybody's out there, check out, check out Ring of Honor. It's a completely different style, and Eric, you're, you know, you're, uh, you've been there from day one, not yeah. anymore there, but you were there day one, so you know exactly what it's all about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, Ring of Honor, um, I have a chat room going uh, during the show, and I've asked some, uh, some people to ask questions in there for you. And um, interesting that you bring it up because I have a question coming from the chat room asking, now that you're a regular part of Ring of Honor, what's your opinion on people like Nigel and uh, Danielson being signed by WWE? Uh, you know what? I think I think it's a good thing. You know, it, it's it's an opportunity for guys to you know further their career and uh, make some real money in this business. And you know that that's the key is you know making money and supporting your family. And they're going to get that opportunity now. Yeah. Um. Do Do you think that? Uh. Well, I mean, uh, let me let me rephrase the question. Who sure. Who on the roster do you think is going to benefit from that? Obviously, with those guys leaving, there are going to be some guys bumped up and maybe get get a shot at the top. Who do you think those guys are going to be, or in your opinion, should be? Um, I, I think that uh, I think one of the guys that's going to really be bumped up to the top, I think, is Hero. I think they're uh, really behind Hero recently, and uh, he's done a great job with his matches and stuff like that. He's been there quite a while now, and he's completely changed his style. He's, he's completely changed his look, which I, I love. Uh, he's, he's gone with the traditional trunks and stuff. So I think it's uh, I think they're really behind him as one guy. I think Roderick is another guy who's, who's ridiculously talented that really needs to uh, uh, be sh- be shown more. So. Mm. Uh, you know what? And another thing about Ring of Honor is that nobody gets kind of short-sighted. It's everybody's in the picture, everybody's a contender, and everybody's a big deal. Whereas a lot of times with other groups, you know, a lot of guys just kind of fall to the wayside or get lost in the shuffle. Where I, I have noticed with Ring of Honor, everybody's given that little spotlight. You know, it may not be as big as uh, the other spotlight, but it, there is a spotlight on every single person. Yeah. Now, um, with you being around Ring of Honor the last several months, does does Ric Flair owe you any money or anything? <laughs> no, no, no! I'm not on that list. Not on that list. No, man. It, it, it was. It was. It, I tell you, it was. It was, uh, it was very interesting to uh, be on the shows with him, man. It was. It was the first time where I got some real interaction with the guy. It was. It was. It was cool. Yeah, that's what. That's what I was gonna ask you. You know, what, what was it like uh, being that close to the Nature Boy? It was cool, man. It was because uh, you know the only other time I met him was it was once when I was backstage at the WWE, and you know that that's a completely different atmosphere. But yeah. it was cool, man, just to see him sitting in the back, and you know it's kind of surreal when you you know you walk in the locker room. There's Ric Flair just sitting there, so <laughs> uh, you know yeah. it, it, definitely cool. Uh, you know I wish uh, I wish it could have ended up differently for Ring of Honor, and they could have benefited a little more from him being a part of the company. But that's a wrestling business. Yeah. Now, now, what's your? Uh, what do you see? I mean, you are the guru. So, what do yeah. you see uh, in the future of Ring of Honor? You know, I mean, with the guys leaving, you know, uh, one door closes, another one opens. There's been rumors about the company, you know, maybe having some financial difficulties. From from where you sit, what what do you see in the future of Ring of Honor? Uh, you know what? I I don't think. You know, people are kind of counting them out and stuff like that, and you know, reading some stuff on the internet and stuff, like you said about the financial problems and whatnot. But I, I think that there there is a uh, audience out there for what their product is. The, the, it, it's not that big of an audience, but there is an audience, and uh, it's going to be tapped into even more so now with the television deal. And I think that once this television uh, gets gets some syndication, uh, international markets and stuff, you're going to see a bigger audience, a wider audience. More people are going to be aware of the product, which I think was a problem since day one, is that no, nobody knew about the product. Yeah. The product was so good, and and I mean, when you watch, you know, when you watch a show, a Ring of Honor show, it just blows away professional wrestling in this country, and it, it just deserves to be watched by more people and more people to be known. And there's a, there's a product, there's a, there's an audience that 
is there for that product that wants to see action in wrestling, especially now, and I know you're a big MMA fan and yes. stuff like that, but it's, it's, it's probably the closest thing to MMA that you're going to get in a pro wrestling environment. <laughs> Yeah. Now, 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 I also have to ask you. You know, I mean, I haven't seen you in a while, but but we've we've kept in touch over the years. And Definitely. you know, the last time I saw you, you know, I I didn't see any six pack uh, around your waist, and all of a sudden I I turned Spike TV, and you're rocking the six pack. Uh, what happened? Where did that come from? Well, it was uh, let's say uh, what year we 2009 in about December of '07, uh, January of '08. I I, I was I was un I was unhappy with the way I looked and. Uh, you know, a lot of it had to do with, I, I spent about a year and a half in Japan, and it just wrecked my diet, and it wrecked mm. my workout routines, and, you know, I, when we first met in 2002, 2003, man, I had that six-pack, it was a lot different, but, yeah. you know, spending that time in Japan, it wrecked my diet and my workout, and by 07, late 07, I was really unhappy, uh, January 08, I'm, you know, everybody makes some New Year's resolutions, I stuck to mine, man, I, I changed up my entire workouts, I changed up my diet completely, uh, I was strict, and uh, by March of 08, I, you know, I was in the best shape of my life and uh you know I, i've sustained that since now you know and, and in that process man i just just completely fell in love with working out again and, and fitness and, yeah. and nutrition and, and you know living a healthy lifestyle and that's just basically all it is man it, it took it took me about three and a half months but man i, I did it and i you know i stuck with it and you know i'm happier than ever wow now, now when's the last time you had a piece of chocolate cake uh, you know what? I, I couldn't tell you the last time I had any kind of cake. And, wow. and I'm not that big of a chocolate fan either. So. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember reading something, and, and I never asked you about this, but I remember reading something online when uh, Paul London was supposed to come in uh, to TNA a couple of months back, and they were uh, yeah. setting up the deal with him and Red, and then I read somewhere that they were talking about you coming in and taking the spot. Right. What's the story behind that? Uh, the story behind I guess it was a Monday, Tuesday, the TV taping, and uh, – Monday, I guess they got a call. I think Paul's match was supposed to be taped on Tuesday. Monday, they got a call, I guess, from Paul or, or Paul's agent or whatever, whatnot, that he wasn't going to be there. Yeah. Uh, so I got a call from uh, from Red, and he said, hey, man, you know, just to give you a heads up, uh, if you're available tomorrow, I think the office is going to call you because your name's been floating around, you know, all day now about you teaming with me tomorrow. I said, well, I mean, nobody's called me officially, so you know, I'll deal with it when I when that happens. No, I didn't really, I didn't get, I didn't get a call officially from them. So I mean, that's I, I, from what I t I talked to uh, Bill Barrett and a couple of the guys, and I, I think the story was they wanted to just keep costs down, and they stuck with uh, I think suicide just because he's local and they didn't need to fly to anybody. And and honestly, Eric, I mean, between you and me, I mean. And whoever else is listening, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think it was just a one. If, if it would have happened, it was going to be a one-shot thing, and I don't, I don't think that would have fit into you know what I was looking for at that time either. Gotcha, gotcha. And and again, we're talking to uh, Son Jay Dutt, and um, you know, I, I had uh, I had somebody on the show a couple of weeks back, and I forget who it was, but we were talking about the state of independent pro wrestling, and I mean, you know, you came up the hard way through the independence. Mm -hmm. You know, I was there with you. Um, you know, and it's Definitely. it's it's a different environment today. And the economy and you know you're you're out there i'm really not out there that much anymore how has the economy affected the independent wrestling scene in your opinion uh it, it's it, it has been affecting and like you said eric you know back when uh, you know we were going strong and hard and uh when we first met and doing the indies and stuff you know at that time, Eric, you know there was a there was a Philly wrestling war, and there'd be mm. ten shows every weekend, and, and you know a twenty thirty mile radi radius, and you know you could do all of them, you know, yeah. and, and it's just not like that anymore. So uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to a find you know quality wrestling shows, and and you know the the, the most important thing is finding you know uh, a place that's going to to, to going to be able to pay you, yeah, and and, and uh, because right now, I mean, you know, after TNA, that this is all I'm doing is the, the Independence Ring of Honor. You know, uh, I had a few uh, you know overseas tours and stuff like that. So it, it, it's uh, it's harder to make a living on the Independence now than ever because this is just not that, that not that many shows qual quality shows that are that are willing to pay, and that that's 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 what it comes down to. Uh, and like like you said, the economy has a lot to do with it. Yeah, entertainment all around is down. Uh, I was just reading the CMLL, uh, you know, their their gates are down, AAA's gates are down, and it's just yeah. all with the economy. But, you know, at first you get that thing where, hey, everybody wants is going to want their entertainment, so they're all going to come out to the shows, and there's going to be a ton of shows, but after a while that kind of catches up, yeah. you know. So I think I think that's where we're at right now. Before it was everybody wants their entertainment, of course, hey, it's a bad economy, you got to, you know, find something to do, but I think now it's at that point where it's it's all caught up. 
Gotcha. Now, uh, you uh, you did a, a tour. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You did a tour of India with TNA a couple years back? Yes, yes, now, I did. What are your memories of that tour? Man, I tell you, it was it was absolutely one of the highlights of my career and, my, and just in my life in general. Uh, it was uh, it wasn't even wrestling, bro. We we were there for two weeks, and all we were doing was media work. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of you know uh, press conferences. You know, we, uh, we we did a lot of live events and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I, I loved it because it was like I'm going back home to my country and. Uh, you know, a lot of those, a lot of the guys over there. You know, a lot of the fans. It was they didn't believe that I was a real deal when I get get over there. And you know, I'm speaking the language. It's like, hey man, this guy is for real. This yeah. guy's one of us, and they they treated me as such. And I've never I've never had that kind of uh, reaction and that kind of a uh, you know response to to me ever. You know, I I felt like I was the rock over there, and it was just an absolutely tremendous, tremendous experience. Wow. Um, you know, and I remember you and I talking about it at the time, and, you know, uh, we were talking about maybe you parlaying that into some kind of a Bollywood career. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, whatever happened with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know what? At the time, the, the guy that ran the, the network that we were on, we, we were on uh, ESPN Star Asia. And, uh, you know, he at the time was, uh, I remember, you know, I remember we were talking about that. Yeah. I told you that uh he had a lot of contacts with Bollywood and stuff, and he, he was going to help me. And uh, I, I guess he doesn't work there anymore. So basically, that was that went all my my <laughs> yeah. hopes and dreams, yeah. you know. But uh, it, it's it's such a different market to get into, man. Especially living over here, you've got to know the right people. You got to you got to know uh, how to get into it. So, uh, and you know, with TNA last year, we kind of blew up, and we were so busy with house shows and and, and touring. We did a couple. We did tour of England and stuff like that. So. Man, last last couple of years have been uh, probably the busiest, and, and uh, I've worked the most I've ever worked in my whole career. The last couple of years with TNA, so you know, as long as I'm busy, man, I'm good. Yeah, so, uh, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Now, um, you know, sp speaking of, speaking of that, it, it, and this is something we've talked about too uh, over the years. It, it always amazed me that WWE never scooped you up because, besides being incredibly talented and and you know, and just having a, a world of potential that you do, it would just seem Thank uh, absolutely. It would just seem a natural fit by attacking the the market in India the way that they do, having somebody that speaks the language that's one of their own. I mean, what Rey Mysterio has done for them for the exactly. Latina market, I, I, it amazes me that they haven't thought the same of you in that Indian market. I, you know what? I I hope somebody out there <laughs> is listening to what you said, Dad. So, uh, but like you said, man, you know, I I agree. I, I think I have a lot to offer. I think I have a lot to contribute to a company like that, where it's such a worldwide. And I mean, a lot of people say worldwide, but they are 100% legitimate worldwide. You know, entertainment entity. And I think I could definitely offer something and contribute that. You know, India is the biggest, most untapped market in this world. It's yeah. a billion people, Eric. You know, yeah. where else can you, you know, have a billion people? And, you know, my, I'm the link to a billion people. So, you know, I, I hope somebody's listening out there that, <laughs> that has some power and give me a call. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's amazing. Um, You know, something I think about whenever anybody asks me about you on the radio show or, or, or just in conversation – I always think back, and, and I'm, I would love to get your thoughts on this, to the ladder match you had in CZW with J.C. Bailey. And I look back on that, and I remember at the time, it was, and I could be wrong on this, but it was right before you started wrestling for MLW, and it was like maybe just weeks before you uh, were scheduled to uh, wrestle for TNA, I think just in the dark match at the time. Yeah. And what I remember about that is, is that it was such a phenomenal match, and you had so many internet writers there, like PW Insider was there, and maybe somebody from The Observer, and everybody just went on the internet and raved about how great you were and how great your match was. And, um, you know, I thought to myself, wow, you know, and then I saw all the opportunities you had afterwards. Right. I think that was really key into exposing you to the wrestling mass out there. You know what, I, I, I remember specifically because uh, as soon as we got done uh, that weekend, that week, I think you had called me and said, hey, man, Mike, Mike Johnson, I think is his name? Yes. From PW, he said, hey, man, he, he kind of really put you over on the, on the Internet. And I, you know, it was new to me. I, I checked it out. And you, you know, I, I totally agree with you. You know, uh, he had a lot of good things to say, and I think that, that kind of held a lot of weight with the Internet community. And that's when things started rolling, man. That, that late, late 2003 was when things just kind of kind of really, really blew up, man. I remember at the time I was still in school as well, and I, you know, after that and after the MLW stuff, you know, I'm still a full-time student in school, and I was doing about 14 to 15 shows a month, and that, and that was, you know, 
just independence and stuff. And my teenage son, things really, things really did take off. And uh, yeah, and, and I remember specifically right before that match with JC Bailey, I'm thinking, what the hell? <laughs> this is a ladder match with a guy that that wrestles barefoot and thumbtacks. What is you know? What are we gonna do? Right. What have I what have I got myself into? <laughs> you know? And so uh, it turned out really good, man. And JC's a hell of a guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, something you got to do a little bit, I think, in TNA, and I know in the indie was team with a guy. I remember you used to tell me you used to uh, think really highly of Sabu, uh, a guy yeah. you're a big fan of. What was it like finally teaming with Sabu? It was awesome, man. It was awesome because, you know, growing up, man, I always kind of looked up to him and, and you know, kind of tried to emulate him when I first started wrestling and stuff. And I, and you could attest to that in my old Sabu pants yes. back in the day and stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, and when I got to tag with him, man, it was great. It was, it was so much fun. And not just getting to tag with him, but just getting to sit there, hang out with him and talk to him. And, you know, we became friends, which was, to me, was priceless, bro. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I mean, to me, um, he seems, uh, in my opinion, like one of the great tragedies of wrestling because, you know, when I really? think, think back on a guy that really is uh, responsible almost as, as just as much as any other wrestler for a lot of what we see today and doesn't have a lot to show for it, it's, it's really a crime, I think, what's, what's happened to him or the ignorance that the wrestling community has had towards him. I, I, I totally agree with you, man. I've, I've always said this from day one. Is, uh, he's, I, he's one of those guys that will never get the, get the credit that he's due for revolutionizing what you know professional wrestling as we know it you know yeah. stuff that we see on every week basis and even on independent shows he'll never get that credit like he deserves man and you know and i don't know if maybe you'll agree with me on this one eric but there's another guy that i think revolutionized indie independent pro wrestling that'll never get the credit that he deserves zandig. that's amazing red zandig Oh, the amazing! <laughs> oh, the amazing! Race. Yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say DJ I. No, but <laughs> no, uh, uh, Red man. Yes. This, you know, I mean, Red was doing stuff uh, that you know nobody had ever seen, and now if you watch any any independent show on every any Saturday night in this country, you're gonna see somebody trying to be like Baby Red. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing because I remember uh, calling his first match when he came in at CZW. I think he was uh, maybe 17 years old. He might have even been 16 right. for all I know. And he came up, he drove up with uh, Mikey Whipwreck and the Maximos, and they had just uh -huh. finished training uh, with him, and they were really just given a spot on the show as a favor to uh, Mikey Whipwreck for uh, doing sure. the show. And they went out there and, you know, as a Full favor, show. absolutely. And, yeah. you know, everybody, and it's no diss on the Maximos because I love those guys, but everybody talked about how great they were. And then you got to see as Red moved away from those guys just how truly great he, he became. And I right. think it's evident, and I'm sure you would uh, probably agree since you've wrestled a lot of these guys, uh, you know, you, you see a lot of his moves stolen today or, or used by other oh, guys today. 100%. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm a culprit of that as well. Uh, Red's, Red's one of the best friends in the businessman. He, he just will never get the respect and the credit that he's due for revolutionizing independent pro wrestling and the style. I mean, that X Division style, you know, of course it's, it's a lucha based and whatnot, but it is really like what those guys were doing on the on the indie scene at that time. That, yeah. that type, that style of wrestling, just nonstop movements and spots and just craziness. And, you know, he was, he was uh, at the top of his game, man. He, he came up with a lot of that stuff that you see every week now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question from the chat room. Uh, somebody asked you in the chat room of a dream opponent, somebody out there that you'd really Really like to wrestle or work with that you haven't had the chance to yet. You know what, man? Uh, every time me and uh, AJ hang out, AJ Styles, you know, we talk about the fact that we've never wrestled one on one. Wow. We we uh, we've tagged before and we've done stuff in battle royals, but we've never wrestled one on one. So, yeah. and uh, I, that would be awesome, man, because we 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 mesh real good. You know, we we always roll around at practice and training and stuff like that. So, I'd love to wrestle him. Yeah. Now that wasn't you under the mask and made that was in the ring working out with AJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I, I was I was the guy that killed the girl on the on the <laughs> monkey. <flip>. Yeah. <laughs> now, now uh, you know we're wrestling a lot of the independents um, that you have over the last year or or so, or or since um you you finished up working with TNA. Yeah. And, and leaving Ring of Honor out of this, because I know they're, they're kind of a home to you right now, who are some of the, sure. the favorite independent uh, companies that you like to work with? Or maybe, what the hell, I have worked with over the years? Uh, you know what? Uh, I guess uh, JP's always been cool, man. Always good, good crowds, good talent. Um, and, and you know what? Lately, I, like you said, ever since I got done with TNA, you know, I've, done, I've done so many just you know, kind of uh, random you know, one-shots here and there. And uh, 
geez, man, there's been so many. I, I, did, I did a show, uh, a couple shows down in Mississippi for a, a small group called Bayou Wrestling, and they were, they were really cool, man. Had their stuff together. And, uh, matter of fact, there was, a, there was actually a promotion in Knoxville, uh, in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, right mm. near Knoxville. And uh, they run shows every Wednesday night at the Armory, and they were real professional, real good real good crowds there and stuff. It, 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 it's funny, Eric, because, you know, now that there's so much free time and so much, in, so much you know, Independence, you yeah. know, no other word for it. But yeah, you're kind of going anywhere and everywhere that I can. It's it's so cool to just see how everything's done in all these little places everywhere and seeing meeting different talents and people like that. And you know, I, I'm having a, I'm having a real fun time. You know, just kind of doing what I want to do and uh, not having any shackles around me based on that. But you know, I love my time in TNA, and I and I always tell people that the the one thing I always miss about TNA is the people. Yeah. You know, I, I met I met friends. That I'll have for life uh, there, and that's one of the main things that I miss being around. It was just you know hanging out with the guys and, and uh, all the people I did meet there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you, you know going back, uh, you know to, to our days in, in CZW, you came back to CZW a couple times after you left TNA. Um, yeah. How how is it different? What were uh, what was the vibe like? So different, you know, uh, and uh, you, you know you were gone. Mostly everybody was gone, and yeah. you know I was. I was told uh, Sandy, and I was told Johnny, say, you know, whenever, you know, if I'm free and, you know, you can use me, I, you know, of course I, I'll always come down for you. And it's just a whole slew of uh, different guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think Nikki is left and Nate's left, but uh, I really can't remember. If, uh, Logan, I guess, is done again yeah. for the second time. Yeah. So I don't know, man. It's just a different, it's, you know, I, when we were there, it was just, it was such a tight-knit, like, family atmosphere, whereas yeah. now it's just, completely different people and new guys and it's just there, there's new guys every month you know one guy will be there one month the next guy is a different guy so it's just not like it was that vibe and that family atmosphere and that that close-knit friendships that we did have at that time that that's not there and i think that had a lot to do with the success of cdw is that we were all striving for one common goal and we were we were so we were such a tight-knit group that you know we we all wanted one thing and we all strived and we worked our asses off to get that yeah it was a it was a very very uh hungry roster there wasn't anybody there uh working that that didn't want it you know yeah, we and, and, and nobody was working for themselves, man. Everybody was working for for the good of the company, and you know we we did tours of Italy, you know yeah. we we got DVDs in the stores. And, you know, hey, man, we we did we did a pretty damn good job. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, in in just uh, winding down here, I always like to ask the guys uh, for a favorite road story. Now you've been everywhere, so I know you have uh, yeah. some good road stories in you. Jeez, man, I, you <laughs> know what people always ask me, that, and I, I really can't come up with one right off the bat. Uh, I'll tell you. I tell you very recently because this is in my head. Okay. Um, I, I was in Egypt uh, last month, and uh, we we uh, we did three shows in uh, Alexandria, which was it was it was gorgeous. It was right off the Mediterranean Sea, and I was at a little resort, and uh, everything was going well. And the, the day of the last show, there's uh there's rumors that we're not getting paid. Oh. So, so you know how that goes. Yeah. Uh, we, so uh, it's about 7 o'clock, everybody's meeting to ready to go to the show, and, you know, nobody's changed. And by the time by, by the time it's like 10.45 at night and no show has started, and the promoter comes in and the guy that owns the resort comes in, and it was just it was a mess. And people are yelling at each other in Arabic back and forth, <laughs> and it's getting hot and heavy, and you can't understand anything that's being said. It, it was surreal, which reminds me of another story, and Eric... Were you there in Italy with John and I, the guy? I like, was not on that tour. That was the next You were not tour. on that one. Yeah, no, I was not on that one. But, I mean, I would love to hear the story told in the air. That one was absolutely crazy. So, uh, I mean, you, you obviously know the story, but I'll, yes. I'll, I'll try to give a short version. So we get to Italy, and uh, one, more, one more time, you know, we rumors that we're not getting paid, yeah. so, and this is the entire CZW roster, I mean, Life Beater's there, Nate's there, you know, the entire CZW roster gets in a room with the promoter of that tour, I think it was only one show, I think we were there for like two or three days, and they get in the room, he doesn't speak any English, there's yeah. an interpreter that's uh, interpreting everything the guy's saying, and basically saying he, he don't got the money, this and that, so <laughs> John Zandig proceeds to slap the ever-living <laughs> shit out of this little guy. This guy had to be 5'5", five, five, uh, and uh, doesn't don't speak English, yeah. skin and bones, and 
and John slaps him across the face and cuts the Zandig promo. I mean, I, I thought he was going to do the pose. Then, yeah. You know, it was it was classic. And he splashed him hard as hell. Wife beater and Nate are trying to rip his suit off, thinking they can pawn it for some money. Yeah. Wife beater's checking out his watch, seeing how much he could get for that. They start pulling his shoes off. They oh. grab his briefcase, try to open his briefcase, try to see what they can get out of there. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah. Uh, one of those things you'll never forget. I'm just sitting back. I'm I'm, I'm half laughing, half thinking, hey man, are we gonna get paid or what? Yeah. And, it, and the next and the next day at the airport we all